and we have just begun. So now we're going to ask all five speakers to address. They all are very active and they travel. And we're going to ask them all to address what they see in terms of developing movement around the country. All over this country, everywhere I've been, and I've traveled around this country extensively, especially in the last year, I've been out to the West Coast, to Alabama, and to L.A., meeting with a group of individuals who have formed an organization which I'm a part of called the Formerly Incarcerated and Convicted People's Movement. These are all former prisoners that have experienced the criminal injustice system. And I'm, let, let me tell you why I say injustice system, because there's two systems that exist in this country. One is criminal justice, and the other is criminal injustice. And the criminal injustice system consists of arrest, jail, prison, parole, back to jail, back to prison, and it's an endless cycle. The criminal justice system that exists in this country here is the one that is primarily reserved for white people, for people middle class and upper class. And that system consists of probation, fines, restitution, house arrest, and non-incarceration, and those are the penalties that they, they, that they give out in that system. That's the system that we want. This other system that exists is the one that everybody around this country, movement is beginning to percolate everywhere. You know, and we see it right here in this room. You know, five, ten years ago, this couldn't have happened. But suddenly people are beginning to wake up. And everywhere we look, you know, we see movement building, right? And we're moving towards that critical point in this struggle where we want to have to begin to start talking about community and start talking about connecting the dots. And that's what's happening all over this country. All of us in this room here, we need not come in here and then walk out unconnected. We need to connect, and that's what's happening around this country. When I think about what's been said and when I think about the question of what work I'm being, I'm, I see being done and what's not being done, I'm actually inspired and motivated. Like Jazz said, what was possible 10 years ago was much more limited in scope than what's possible now. And I think a big reason why there are so many more possibilities now is because there's a bigger gap between those who are privileged and comforted, and, and, and comfort rather, than those who don't. When I look at Doc's last book, uh, The Rich and the Rest of Us, he begins to talk about that growing gap between the have-nots and the have-gots that's expressed through all sorts of social uh, misery for black folk, for brown folk, for poor folk. I mean, it's getting more and more vast, the gap between those two extremes. And so I think that's part of why you see the response on the ground all around the country and really all around the world that you're beginning to see. So as I travel the country, I see all sorts of pieces that speak to the prison crisis. I, I agree with Michelle that the mass incarceration crisis is the biggest thing that we're facing as a nation, as a, as a global community. The question, though, is how do we respond to it? For me, what I'm saying right now is in different pockets and different areas of political work and different communities and different areas, I see people doing work that is directly connected to the prison industrial complex struggle, directly connected to the resistance against mass incarceration. I think the challenge, though, is for us to connect the dots. So I, you look in New York or Philadelphia or New Orleans or Baltimore, you look around, you see mass education reform, just to give you an example. And you see people on the ground struggling not just to get better schools and, and to have their kids do better on high stakes standardized tests, but people are beginning to see the direct connection between these first class jails and these second class schools. People see the connection. You, you, you can't miss it, right? People, people see the direct connection between black and brown people who become criminalized at a very early age the moment they walk into school. You go to Harlem, you go to East New York, you go to Queens, you go to the Bronx, you see a line down the street of people trying to get into these schools, right? And the, the reason the line is so long is because they're being searched, 
They're being checked, there's surveillance cameras, more surveillance equipment has been used in schools than prisons over the last five years. So you begin to see the infrastructure of prison. You see police officers, probation officers, par parole officers. You begin to see dogs sniffing at our kids. You begin to see random locker searches, fingerprint scans, body scans. You begin to see this entire infrastructure of prison and so it takes you 20 minutes to get into school. Once you get in, ain't nobody stopping you from leaving, right? The entire infrastructure is about controlling and preparing and disciplining our bodies for life in prison more so than it is for anything possibly educational. So we're beginning to see that. Right. People, people on the ground People on the ground are beginning to see how our, how our children are being criminalized at an early age. They're beginning to see the relationship also between the lack of access to education, the lack of access to early literacy, and incarceration. If you, if you can't read at eight, there's a really good chance you're going to be incarcerated at 18. That's the logic of the day, and that's what we're beginning to see. And so I see a lot of work in that area. Another area that I see work being done is mental health. You know, if, if, I think you said this 10, 20 years ago, you said the, one of the greatest crises of the 21st century, one of the biggest challenges of the black community for the 21st century will be one of mental health. And I think that, that we can't understate how important mental health is to our community, but we also can't understate the connection. This is important. The connection between mental health and mass incarceration, because what we've seen over the last 30 years is not just incarceration, but transcarceration. We have seen people move from one form of institution to another. In the 1980s, 1970s, we had some form, not great, but some form of mental health facility for people struggling with mental health. And just to set the taboos aside, we all got struggles with mental health. Ain't no way you could be black or brown or poor in America and not have some struggles with mental health. That's just the reality of it. And, and, and white folk too, for the very same reason. It's something crazy making about privilege too. You know what I mean? So, but 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 what happened? But what happened over those 30 years that we saw a divestment from mental health resources, a divestment from preparing people or, or treating people through mental health, right? So we moved from a, a, a medicalized state to a criminalized state, to the penal state. Right? And so those very same people under the Reagan administration, at the same time they were beginning to prosecute a war on drugs, we were taking money out of mental health, those people who were in mental facilities go to the street. And then we criminalized being on the street through a range of public policies on a state level, like, like uh, criminalizing homelessness, criminalizing loitering, public drunkenness, public urination. We did all this stuff that might on its face seem intuitively okay, but what it ended up with is people who should be in mental health facilities on the ground. And then they're on the ground and they have greater access to drugs. And then we criminalize the medical addiction of drugs. And then after you criminalize the medical addiction of drugs, you have people with mental health tr trouble with the medical addiction to drugs now incarcerated, subjected to greater trauma, greater abuse, dislocation, isolation, marginalization, and no access to anything else. Then they get out of jail. They still don't have access to housing. And so at this point, prison has actually become the only sustainable form of public housing that the government has invested in in the last 30 years. I mean, you see what I'm saying? I'm going to take my seat in a minute. Take your time, brother. You know, when the preacher said, you know what's about to happen. Take your time. Nah, nah. <laughs> now, but I'm about, I'm about to pass this thing, but the thing, but the point here is, at the end of the day, which you, at, at the point they leave prison, they then enter the zone that Michelle talks about so marvelously in the new Jim Crow. So I see people working on mental health, and I see people working in education, and then I see people reacting to Troy Davis, reacting to Trayvon Martin, reacting to Shaquanda Cotton, reacting to Janala Wilson. We could go around the country and see all the, react the reactions. We see the reaction to Mumi Abu-Jamal. We see the reaction to all the political prisons around the country. And in each pocket, we're talking about the death penalty. We're talking about torture. We're talking about isolated housing. We're talking about these things. But what we have to do is connect the dots, connect the education movement and the education, the radical education educational left movement to the mental health movement. Connect that to the movement against the death penalty. Connect that to the movement against isolated housing because that's what's not happening right now. And when we connect those dots and we organize and we galvanize and we mobilize, we end up with a strong movement not to reform, but to what? Prison abolition. Thank you. Traveling the nation, I see precious human beings of all colors, cultures, 
sexual orientations, who are living in an empire in relative economic decline because of corporate greed and big banks and big corporations who have been generating billions of dollars with no productive value, no concern about public interest and common good. I see working people being pushed to the edge and I see poor people being rendered invisible. I see deep cultural decay because I see an obsession with stimulation and titillation and weapons of mass distraction that keeps people sleepwalking and keeps people complacent, keeps people complicit, and keeps people carefully not wanting to tell the truth about the, the, the country in which we live. And I see political paralysis of two political parties that are tied to Wall Street and big corporations. Though, though there are some differences, they are in denial about the fundamental issues facing the empire. And let us be honest about it. Anytime you talk about the crimes in America, and anytime you talk about the mass incarceration and the resistance against mass incarceration, it takes us back to the initial crimes of white supremacist mistreatment of our precious indigenous brothers and sisters. They don't have to be in the room for us to acknowledge the role that they had to go through in order for America to become America. And then the second sin, which is the enslavement of Africans. And it has been the black freedom movements and the anti-racist movements that has reminded America when America was about to go under that you either renew your democratic possibilities or you become another nation, crypto-fascist, authoritarian, autocratic, patriarchal, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-Islam, shaped with xenophobia. So when we talk about hyper-incarceration, we're talking about the ways in which our precious young people, disproportionately black and brown, who could have used their energies to be part of a movement, a freedom movement, a black freedom movement. I say black freedom movement. I'm talking about justice and freedom. Don't believe the hype that the black freedom movement is not, has been solely about the freedom of black people. That's not true. Frederick Douglass didn't believe it. Martin didn't believe it. Ella didn't believe it. They began on the chocolate side of town, but it spilled over to vanilla folk, spilled over to yellow folk, spilled over to brown folk. But you're going to have to start with the legacy of white supremacy if you're going to really transform this system. That's why when our dear sister said New Jim Crow, that's why when Sister Angela said, when I'm talking about abolishing prisons, it's part of an anti-white supremacist movement. And people have been so in denial and in the age of Obama. <laughs> it's difficult to be honest about how vicious this system, the, the white supremacist legacy really is with our precious black brother in the White House. Because it constitutes progress only to the degree to which we're less racist than we used to be, but we're more racist than institution when it comes to black poor, brown poor, when it comes to the possibilities of those who could constitute a movement. And so this movement is, begins with mass incarceration, but in the end, it's about the fundamental transformation of an empire that has democratic possibilities if we have the courage to fight for it and execute it. And if not, we slide down a slippery slope to hatred, revenge, domination, and subordination. That's why I got a smile on my face, because that's the kind of people I want to be with. Yes, sir.